This is Travis O'Gwen with Strange Music, and you're watching Hot New Hip Hop. The odd thing was, man, I was in the furniture business. I was actually in the furniture business in a very big way, uh, to the tune of um, 32 locations in 18 states. So I started that when I was very young. I started that when I was 17, and just developed it into something pretty massive. And um, and then you know at some point uh, I started taking the revenue and some of the profits that I got from that and invested in other things such as real estate. And then I started getting into uh, urban apparel back when it was real big, back when Fubu was big, all of the all of the you know Carl Kanai was doing his thing, all those people. And I got involved in it, and that was kind of the segue into meeting tech because. Here locally, we had this company called Paradise Originals. And I got involved primarily on the financing side, and then I started to get more entrenched in it, and then we wanted local celebrities to wear the clothing, and that's how I met Tech, because we started doing stage clothes and things like that for them. But my background before that was furniture and real estate. You know what, man, I've always been a huge fan of music, a very, very big fan of music. And I went to a school here in Kansas City uh, Van Horn High School is where I ended up at and um, it's within the Kansas City Missouri School District and uh, at least it was back then and so 80% of my school was black folks 80% of my school was african-american so I was around that type of music so and I'm talking about the early stuff I'm talking about stuff where I was listening to MC Shan and I was listening to Kumo D and I was listening to Run DMC of course and then when the West Coast stuff hit you know and when I first time I heard Eazy E and NWA like I lost my shit you know what I mean and so I was always a fan of hip-hop I was always a fan of, of the early hip-hop especially and the meaningful hip-hop uh, you know, so, uh, you know, being such a huge fan, the opportunity when it presented itself, uh, you know, and, and I didn't mean to get into this business, to be brutally honest with you. What I thought I could do is I, th I met Tech and I thought he was an over overwhelming talent. The guy was out of his mind out of here with, with the ability to put together incredible songs and lyrics. So when I first met him, it was my intention to meet up with him and maybe give him some business advice because, you know, he was buzzing and buzzing and buzzing, but never going there. And there was always talks about, hey, this is coming up, this is coming up, this is coming up but they never came to fruition. So I, I got involved and I said, man, what's going on? You know, and, and that's, that was the beginning of me uh, accidentally getting into the music business. You know? Tech always seemed very set in his ways as far as what he wanted to do musically. Uh, however, when I met him, he had like six different people pretending to be his manager. So you had this, this girl, and I'm not gonna say any names, and then you had like five other guys. And then not only that, but when I met him, he was signed to QD3, uh, Quincy Jones' son, which was through Quest, which was Pops himself, which was Quincy Jones, and uh, which was also then segued through Warner Brothers. But um, nobody knew what the fuck they were doing. They knew had no idea what to do with Tech because he's so left of center, you know what I mean? Uh, come on, dude, he's, he's, a, he's a black dude with a painted face and red spiked hair who does you know a fair share of darker music and who's not necessarily doing traditional song structure either. But the shit was so good. But they just couldn't figure out where to go because he didn't fit. And I mean, at one time I heard a conversation about them talking about, man, do we put him in the rap section or the alternative section? I'm like, really? Are you guys fucking serious? All this time, you know, I kept hearing about all the big things that were getting ready to happen, but they never happened. So I called a meeting with him and I said, man, okay, what's the deal? Tell me your story. And that's when he told me about all the different people that were involved in his career. So you've heard the term, too many chiefs, not enough Indians, too many chefs in the kitchen, all that type of shit. That's really what he had going on. He had too many people trying to be the manager. And they really, I think, had their best interest in mind versus his. And so, you know, when you have that going on, it's hard to progress. So when he first sat down with me and he told me the entire story, I'm like, ah, okay. Um, man, good luck. You know, I really didn't have anything to say because I knew, oh, listen, this isn't just about advice. This is about money. This is about lawyers. This is about a hell of an undertaking. If this is going to go anywhere, it's going to take a lot of time, effort, energy, and money. And at the time, I wasn't interested. I was making such good money. I was having a ball. Life was good. But um, then as time progressed, again, he kept calling me and uh, he brought me down to the studio and I heard a song called This Ring. Uh, it's off of the Angelic album that we put out. And dude, I couldn't leave it alone. Like I must have played that song a thousand times. And 
that one song that said, okay, hold on, man, let me meet with this dude again. Everything you said to me before, I got it. Fuck all of that. What do you want to do? And that's when he told me about, you know, his love for the doors and the idea of strange music. And if he had his own label, he would call it strange music and, and all these different things. And I said, listen, man, uh, if, if you want to do this, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll help you put this together. We'll do a 50-50 and, uh, you know, here we go. You know what I mean? And uh, he was down and uh, it, it, took, it took a while, man. It took about a year and a half just to clean up the messes before we could even move forward. And we put out the first record back in 2001. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's how it started. I really started from scratch, but I did study everybody. And, and, and some of the stuff that I studied wasn't what you're thinking, right? So, of course, I studied what was going on with No Limit. Of course, I studied what was going on with Cash Money. Of course, I studied, you know, a lot of, like, what Priority was doing. Uh, I also studied what some of the majors were doing. But the people that I really took an interest in are, are people like uh, Hank Williams Jr. and his story. And, and really dissected it and then spent a lot of time with Hank Williams Jr. at his house down in Paris, Tennessee, just listening to the stories, trying to understand, talking to the people around him. You know, I, he had this thing every year called Butt Naked Barbecue at the 4th of July. And I'd go down there just to soak up as much information as I could. And then I started really studying the model that uh, Kid Rock did. I started studying people that were a little bit outside of the genre in which they ended up winning in, right? Uh, you think about Kid Rock and his early shit when he lived downstairs from Queen Latifah and, and, and all of that, and you, you look at what he was trying to do in rap, and he kind of merged that into a rap rock, which ultimately merged into a country rock, and he's had just an overwhelming amount of success. Hank Williams Jr., man, they did not, country music would not let this guy in the door. And then eventually, once he continued to go out there and play shows and do swag, as they call it, a merchandise, and go to bar to bar and do what he was doing, uh, they eventually let him in. And then he won like Artist of the Year multiple years in a row, and he became one of the biggest people in country music. Uh, you know, I look at things like that. I look at what Big Machine and Taylor Swift has done, to be honest with you. Phenomenal. Dude, she just wrote a letter that got Apple to get their head out of their ass recently. Impressive. Impressive. I, I opted out of the whole Apple deal. Me and a lot of other guys said, hey, listen, we love you guys, but you got this, you got us fucked up. So, you know, if you're going to do that, we're opting out for now. And ultimately, I think that her persuasion, because of, if she's one of the most powerful people in the music business at 25 years old. That's awesome, by the way. But, uh, you know, just studying what other people are doing and then applying business to, to uh, not very business savvy industry. The music business is not filled with a lot of great businessmen. It's filled with a bunch of people who wanted to be artists and then ultimately couldn't do it and win at it, and then they ended up being something else. And some of those people don't belong in it. You know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of really ridiculously um, unqualified people within the music business, especially the majors. Sorry. My goal is to do business very similar to a Japanese philosophy. And in the Japanese philosophy, it's, it's kind of a, a different way of thinking. So a lot of these early Japanese companies during their heyday of growth, they would need, let's say, financing. So they would need to, in America, we would go to a bank in an attempt to get a loan for the necessary money, the necessary capital to do what we need to do. In Japan, they're so forward thinking that if a large company needed a large sum of cash, they would go and buy the bank. It's, it's a matter of taking and being, going 10 steps past what you would conventionally think. So if I need merchandise printed, um, I don't want to continue to go to people that print merch. I want to cut those motherfuckers out. No offense, guys, sorry. But I want to be the guy that's operating that business as well. Why? Because I have a built-in customer. Nothing different than the studio. I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm giving studios several hundred thousand dollars a year. As much as I like Chuck Chapman and the people that own Chapman Studios, um, that's not really the smartest thing I could have been doing. So what do I do? I go out and I invest $4 million. I build one of the nicest studios in the U.S., really. And uh, we create a home and we create a self... I mean, we already had a, 
a built-in dude. That place has been busy since the day I opened the doors. Both studios booked nonstop. So, but again, the most exciting part about what I'm doing now and our newest investment lies in that set of plans over there. And it's a very large facility, state-of-the-art equipment, screen printing, digitizing, embroidery, uh, other stuff like rhinestone decoration, and all these other really cool uh, merchandise processes that we'll then be doing in-house ourselves. And uh, I already have this, this kick-ass customer lined up for it called Strange Music. And so, so Strange World Merchandising's biggest customer will be Strange Music. And then you never know what will happen after that. Maybe we'll end up doing all of Slipknot's merchandise. Maybe we'll end up doing Katy Perry. You never know. Like, whatever it takes. As far as me thinking, you know, is, is this idea sustainable? Should I continue it? Have I ever questioned that? Hell yeah, I questioned it. When I was about $2 million in of my own money, um, uh, if I didn't question it, my wife sure did. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? But, you know, I had many different businesses before this, and um, I've had several more that I've opened since then, too. And other, I, have, I think I have like 11 different companies right now. And, and so my thought was this, man. I had never failed. I got my ass kicked a few times and had to get back up, but I ultimately always found a way to win at whatever business I chose to pursue, right? And so when I got my ass kicked in the music business and I did a deal with J Core, a guy named Jay Ferris, you piece of shit, uh, when I did uh, that deal and then he walked with everybody's money, including ours, um, that, that shit really pissed me off, man. I was down, you know, I, I lost 400 grand on that. And you know we had another deal with Mark Cerami, the guy that started Priority Records with Brian Turner. And at first it was really, really good. And then it became not so good. And so there's a lot of money uh, that's in limbo there as well. Uh, um, and so we had to hit a couple speed bumps. And, and you know what though? I look at it as, as, uh, as tuition. You understand what I'm saying? So uh, hard lessons to learn but I learned them, and I learned them in the, the, the most roughest of ways, right? But, you know, we couldn't get distribution in the beginning because Tech hadn't sold any records. So nobody was trying to hear us. So what we have to do, we had to do a deal with a middleman. Jay Ferris and Jay Core Records was that middleman. He was up there in New York. He, you know, he had a lot of early stuff. He did Master Ace, and he, he picked up 8-Ball and MJG. He owned a company called Mammoth that he sold off to Disney. And then, um, then he be, became more of a piece of shit and ended up robbing everybody and taking their money and, and running like a little bitch. Uh, so then, you know, we had to, to to get out of that deal. We ended up getting that record back. That's the record Angelic we put out with him in 2001. Here we are, 2015, and I'm still pissed off about it. Um, I don't fuck with that dude. I don't know if you can tell that. But uh, then, you know, we had to do another deal. We still didn't have enough clout. We did a deal with, uh, with MSC, which was Mark Steven Cerami, I believe, who again was one of the halves of priority, came up with the California Raisins, and then of course did Dr. Dre, NWA, No Limit, everything else. You know, and then that deal ran its course, uh, and, and it was really, we put out a couple of, we put out Absolute Power, then we re-released Angelic, then we did Vintage Tech, and we did a couple other projects, Scatter and Snug, Cut Calhoun, uh, those projects, and the deal kind of ran its course. He lost interest because he couldn't recreate priority records, you know, six years later. Uh, he lost interest, and he's on boats in Micronesia. I don't even know where the fuck that's at. You know what I mean? But he he lost interest. We also had a bit of an issue with the financial portions and uh, his his account his creative accounting. So we ended up getting out of that situation. We looked up and we realized, man, we're a half million records deep. I wonder if there's anybody interested now. And at that time, there was this brand new startup called Fontana. Fontana was the storefront for Universal's independent distribution. People realized there was going to be a shift into more independent music. You know, we started being, we was independent in 2000, 99, 2000, when the shit wasn't cool. Independent music in 2000 and rap, that wasn't sexy. That's not cool. And, and now it's like the thing. You know what I mean? Like everybody wants to be independent or at least claim independent. Even when they're not independent, they claim independent. You feel me? You know, I, I watched, you know, TDE, we, we, we did a partnership with them when I signed J-Rock, and, and we did a first right of refusal on, on everybody, Kendrick, Schoolboy, all those guys. And, uh, you know, they even after the deal on Kendrick, 
Nobody knew that he still wasn't wholly independent for quite some time. They didn't know Interscope was in the background. But, um, you know, independent is that new shit. You know what I mean? And so TDE and all their accomplishments, wow. I like to think that uh, we had some influence there because Dude and Punch and all those guys, uh, Dude and Punch, we spent a lot of time with. And, and I applaud their success, man. They're doing so well. The times in which we had a middleman, somebody in between us and our money, are the times that weren't so pleasant. Those are the times where there's been mishaps, uh, miscues, uh, misdirection. And uh, when we eliminated that with getting away from J-Core and or getting away from MSC, when we eliminated those people and we got to do it wholly on our own, starting honestly, man, this only started in 2006. When we put out Ever Ready, that was our first wholly nothing but us record. And if you think about the success we've had in, what is it, nine years? Oh, shit. Because all of this, all these buildings, all that stuff has happened in the last nine years. And nine years can seem like a really long time or it can seem like yesterday. And to me, it kind of seems like both sometimes, you know what I mean? But, but when, we, when you are truly and wholly in control of it and you care about it, and you won't take no for an answer and you won't give up and you won't fail, um, that's really what Tech and I are all about, man. It's like nothing can stop us. And, and people try, you know? I mean, people, okay, think about this. Back in 2000, how many independent hip hop tours can you name? You, well, you can't, I'll just make this simple. You can't, how many independent hip hop artists went out and really toured? How many hip hop artists went out and toured in 2000? 2001, 2002. It was rare. It was very, very rare. So when I started the process of trying to get uh, uh, into these clubs and into these venues, rap music had two black eyes. Nobody wanted to have a rapper in their building. And then I come along with a rapper named Tech Nine. Really? Fucking really? And that white America, white club owners, white whatever, did not want to let some rapper named Tech Nine in there. Hell no, gangster rap. Oh no, they automatically assume because the name's Tech Nine is gangster rap. And so I had to make deals with some of these people back in the days. Like, listen, man, if anything goes wrong at all, keep the money. Keep it. Just keep it. You don't owe us anything. Like I had to make those kind of deals to get in the door. We go in, we do one show, incident free. Everybody was great. My crew, my people, everybody respectful, on point, on time. Those same club owners that I had to beg to get in the door. Hey, uh, so when do you think you guys are coming back? Uh, I mean, you know, are you guys going to be doing another tour? Dude, I went to Spokane, Washington seven times in one year. Come on, man. Sold out seven shows in one year in Spokane, Washington. All over the... Dude, the last tour I did, I did 60 shows. Had 170 offers for 60 shows. I can't even keep up with the amount of demand that's going on right now for tech and some of these other artists. Had six tours out at the same time. But everybody's trying to do it now. Everybody's on tour, bro. So when I helped build this framework of independent touring and, and touring rappers, I shared it with a lot of people. Some of them deserve it, some of them don't, right? And now they've created a congestion, but with my axe, I can normally clear holds and I don't have the same traffic problems that a lot of people have. But look at everybody touring right now. Everybody's on tour, bro, everybody. And, and that's cool, get it, let's go get it. I just hope they don't fuck it up. All the guys that don't do it right, that show up super late, that go to the club doing outlandish, retarded shit, bringing underage chicks backstage, those are the guys that I wish would stop touring. And all the guys doing it right and being respectful and handling their business, continue on, my friend. You know what I mean? You know, for all the people out there, whether you go the major route, whether you go the independent route, whatever you do, you just have to stay true to yourself. And I wish that the artists would do that. I hate artists that go out there who are really dope and then they conform to this overwhelming A&R uh, that, that happens within that system. Um, I, w I do hope and I do wish that the music gets better and that people start paying attention to the lyrics again. And some of the ridiculously dumbed down stuff uh, would at least bring it up a notch or two. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of people that there, there's, you have, musically correct is of course an opinion, right? But there is this general foundation of musically correct. 
And when you do everything you can to demolish what is musically correct, you put it out and it actually finds some weird way of being a quick fad, you're discounting the entire movement of hip hop. You're discounting when you're on, on there whining and making funny ass sounds and being offbeat or out of key, you are looked at by true musicians as, look at these motherfuckers, look at these clowns. This is why I hate rap music. This is why hip hop is not really music. This is why rap shouldn't even be on a shelf. Pay attention to your craft. Care about the music. Care about what you are outputting. Care about it in a way that, that, that you look at this as more than a check. This is more than, than, than you trying to gain popularity to, to get pussy or whatever it is your goals are. But pay attention to the music. If you do that, all those other things will come. Everything that we do is all based around music. Everything is based around music. Nothing else happens unless the music is correct. And we don't let the music out unless it's right. If they focused more on that instead of, okay, so yeah, I got that, and now I need to do this, this, this. And one other thing I'll leave you with is once you do have the music absolutely all the way there, mixed, mastered, packaged beautifully, congratulations, you're 20% of the way there. You're 20% of the way there. Now you have the other 80% to do, and it's the most important 20%. It's the foundation for real, but now you got to build on to it. And this is because, I mean, so many artists are like, oh, man, I'm good, man. I already got my shit done. I'm about to, it's about to be pressed up, and it's on the way back right now. And, yeah, so we're like 95% of the way there. No, you're not. First of all, I doubt that what you pressed up is 100, but on top of that, that's now if you have the perfect project, you're 20% of the way there. 20%. Now you have to find a way to get that to the people. You got to make sure you build an online presence. You have to make sure that you know and understand social media. You have to understand what it takes. You have to understand how to perform. I met artists that I was a fan of, and then they get on stage, and I'll be like, oh, god damn. Oh, what are y'all doing? Did you not think to rehearse this shit before you came out here and grabbed your nuts and grabbed a microphone? Like, let's think about the performance. You know what I'm saying? That's vital to all of this. You know, that's why we're rocking crowds of 60 and 70,000 people is because we cared about all of that shit. That's why we just did Brockfest, 68,000 people in Kansas City. That's why we just headlined Denver Summer Jam, 18,000 or whatever the hell, 20,000 sold out. That's why we just co-headlined Seattle Summer Jam, sold out. Because they're getting a performance, you know what I mean? So care about what you're doing. This is more than about money, liquor, weed, and bitches. It's about music first. So right now we uh, stepped across the street from Strange Music Headquarters and we are at what is known as The Wash. It's uh, one of our most uh, recent endeavors. So new hoses, new walls, new everything to make it look extra clean, extra nice. Obviously the logo and the branding is, is prominent. And we do get a lot of fans that come up. I think it's cool to bring people up from your, from your section. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of talent here.